Amen. We are, in case you all have noticed, we are seriously living in the last days. Amen? That's what the word of God says. When you see all these things happening, look up. Your redemption draws near. Draw it nigh. Amen? When the Bible says look up, it doesn't literally mean you should be looking up in the sky expecting something to fall out of the heavens. It means be ready. Be prepared. Amen? For the thief in the night is about to make his appearance. And the fact that he's coming like a thief in the night, meaning that if you're not ready, you will be caught. Surprise. Amen? And we don't want the trumpet to sound and the dead in Christ to rise up first and those that who are alive and remain are not ready. So there's no transformation. And there's just a great disappearance and then of many thousands and millions of people and you show up to church on Sunday and realize that a few people are missing. For some churches, it'll be almost church as usual because a lot of churches are doing their own thing and not God's thing. And as I share over and over again, our God is very, very, very rigid. He does not compromise. He doesn't lower his standards, but he makes a way that we can come up to his standard. Amen? And we must take the necessary steps to come up to his standard. Amen? Amen? As Brother Delroy shared, you know, last week, it was uh, a few weeks ago, it was the week, Easter weekend when everybody thought about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, you know, we ought to live a life of perpetual resurrection. Amen? Jesus Christ said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. Amen? We all have to die to the Lord, to ourselves, that we may live to the Lord. Amen? Amen. And it's... um. It's kind of sad today that the Christian church have lost its effectiveness. When I look back at the early church, amen, what happened? When I look at Peter, James, John, all these disciples, simple men, and see what they did. You see, took, first it started with 12, then it went down to 11, then it went up to 120, and they turned the world upside down. One reason they were able to do this, because they waited for the promise, and when they received the promise, they went forward in sincerity. Amen? And we today have to be like-minded. You know, when I look at the Christian church today, if I was to put a group of Christians and a group of unbelievers in a lineup, I know this may seem to be ritualistic, like do's and don'ts, but I will not be able to tell the difference, who is who. Not looking at their attire, but just looking at their faces. When I look at Christians today, I don't see no glow. I don't see no joy. I don't see no evidence of peace. I see the same things I see when I look at people and not say. We should stand out. Amen? As Christians. The Bible says, let your light shine before men. There should be a glow about us. Amen? If you have something good, I could guarantee you. If somebody just won $50 million dollars. And you put them in a lineup. I could guarantee you. There will be a glow on their face. There will be a smile that you can't wipe off. Amen. And you may not see the reality of this. But that is dung. Compare. To what we have. The thing is. Do we believe it? If God gave you the choice of living a life for him with trials and tribulation and persecution 
ought to give you a life outside of him. With all the riches of the world. Never having to worry about anything. Which one you think will be the better life? On the surface, to be prosperous in the natural, would want to take our attention. We say, this would be probably the best. But in actuality, the Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And I'm seeing the church is heading. I'm getting some feedback here, brother Duncan. I'm getting some feedback. Then you can take the, um, the monitors down a little bit. Um, I'm seeing the church today conforming to the world. Everything that the world is doing, we are follow suiting. Yeah, we're doing the same thing. Amen? Is it, is not so? We are following the trends that are made by man instead of following God. And it's kind of strange because this is not new. The wise man Solomon said that nothing is due under the sun. What was will be. It will repeat itself over and over and over again. And there was a bunch of people who were God's children. The seed of Abraham, Israel, Jacob, the supplant who became Israel, prince. And God made of them a mighty nation. And he took them out of bondage. Egypt, amen, you remember that? He supernaturally took them out of Egypt. And he led them through the wilderness to the promised land. And he had to do a little 40 years extension of the journey because of unbelief. He had to get rid of the doubters. But eventually they got into the promised land. But just before they got into the promised land, God warned them that they're going to see different styles of worship. These worship are the reason why they were inheriting the land. Because remember, when Moses, when, I mean, when Abraham first came out of Ur of the Chaldees and when he was going through the land that God promised him, he said the sins of the Hittites and the Amalekites and the people in that area were not yet to its maximum. They still had a little chance for grace. But at this time, when they came out, after 400 plus years being in Egypt, and they came out and they came back to Canaan land, God had said, enough was enough. I've given all the opportunity for repentance. And these nations have not heeded my warning. So therefore, I am going to eliminate them. I am going to get rid of them. I'm going to take what they have. And I'm going to give it to you, my children. But he said, I will not do it all in one sweep. Because if the land is barren, then the wild beasts will come in and occupy and then it will be difficult. Amen? So he will do it gradually. Town by town, nation by nation, I mean city by city and so forth. He will wipe them out. And we see when they cross over Jordan. We see the start right away. We see the wind around the walls of Jericho. You know Jericho was a mighty nation. Fortified, almost impenetrable. Nobody could get to that place. And what did God do? God told him to march around that place. And the march around that place 13 times. And when they made a shout at the, in obedience to God, the walls came down. Amen? Remember that? God has started to fulfill his promises and his prophecy to them. That I'm going to give you this land and nobody will be able to resist you. Amen? You remember that? So that's nation number one. Nation number two. A small civilization called AI. So, the Bible says, when one is going to build a house, or make, a, going to war against an enemy, he must first count the cost. Amen? He must first study to see whether he have enough to build his house, or if he's going to go into war, to see whether he have the force to fight against his enemy, or if he should make a condition of peace. Right? So in line with the wisdom of God, Joshua sent out a few spies to spy out AI. You remember the first story about the first set of spies that caused him to go on 40 years? 40 years. They kind of blew it, right? So they sent out some more spies again, and when they went to AI, they said, they are a, a comfortable people. 
They have no walls. They are a little people. Let's not send up the whole army. Let's just send up a few thousand. And we can take them out easily. Amen? And they went. And the Bible said, they, 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 they were started to, they was chased, they, they fell at Ai. They were slaughtered. A few of them were slaughtered. And Joshua started to weep and said to God, what is going on here? Didn't you promise us that you will defeat all these army, the armies of these nations? And what did God say to Joshua? Get up. If you had did right, wouldn't you possible? Is there not sin in the camp? And he said, somebody have stolen, have disobeyed me and have stolen an abominable piece of art that I have commanded not to partake of. You see, we got to be very careful with the instructions from God. Amen? When God went, sent them to Jericho, he said to destroy everything. Don't take no bounty. Destroy everything. Everything, everything in that place is a curse. I don't want to touch anything. Right? And there was a guy called Achan. He saw a nice piece of gold. And he said in himself, this is good. Why should I burn up this? I could get some personal wealth from it. So secretly, he stole the gold and went under his tent and dug a hole in the floor of his tent and covered it over and hid the gold. And he had a smile on his face as if he just won the $50 million. And then when God started to pour his judgment upon Israel because of disobedience of one individual, and God started to cast the lots and it came down to him. And they said to him, give God the glory, tell the truth. And he confessed. And they stoned him to death. And they piled a heap of stone over his body as a memorial, as a message for those who would in the future think about breaking the rules of God, the consequences. And then they went and they defeated Ai. But this time they went with the full army. And then, if you go down through the years, Israel, the people of God, you think they would learn from the mistakes? And they start to emulate or to copy the ways that his nation worship their gods and God would warn them over and over and over and over again and they would conform to the world instead of heeding what God had said and it went on for years and years and years and eventually the Lord said once again it was enough and they went into captivity into Babylon now I'm saying all that to say this. The Bible said in, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that all these things that happened to Israel happened so that we will not follow or fall in the, the same traps that they did. That we will learn from their mistakes. You know, a wise man will learn from his mistakes. Amen, that is true. But a wiser man will learn from other people's mistakes. Amen. If you see somebody walking on the street and they fall into a pothole, why would you not go and avoid that pothole but do the same thing? That is not wise. So, well, I got to learn for myself. No, you don't have to. You have seen from somebody else. So all these things happen. When Israel start to follow the world, then we see what happened. That God poured out his wrath upon them. And that is a lesson for us cannot be hidden. It is written in stone, so to speak. Amen? But today I look at the church and we are doing everything just like Israel did. We take the word of God and we take the pieces that we like. We'll take the blessings. We say the promises of God are yea and amen. And so it is. But are the promise of God all blessings? They are blessings and they are curses. Amen? He's faithful to perform his blessings and he's faithful to perform his curses. But the thing that are confusing us today 
is a thing called mercy and grace. Because God is holding back the floodgates of his wrath from coming upon us, we think in that is a sign of God's approval. So we are thinking that God is okay with our behavior. So instead of repenting, we are stiffening our necks. And God has been warning us in this church. I don't know what's happening in the other churches. But God says that he's a God of fire. He's a God of judgment. He said, the Bible says he will purify the sons of Levi. He will take them through the furnace and they will come forth as pure gold. The Bible says who God loves, he chastens. The Bible said, no chastening at the t- present time seem pleasurable. But in the end, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Amen? But if we fail to heed his chastisement, just like it was written in the law, if you had a son who was a rebel disobedient and would not turn, the parents say, you, 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 you punish him, you do all you could, and yet this son will not heed and will not turn, from being a glutton, a drunkard. The Bible said, you take that one to the city gate before the elders and said, this son of ours would not obey us. And the sentence was for the parents to take the first stone and throw it at that, their own child and the rest what will do likewise to wipe out the spirit of disobedience, so that others would heed. Amen? These things are for our examples, that we should not likewise be rebellious. So when God starts to chastise you, don't say this persecution. If there is no sin in your life, then it is persecution. Then you could stand up like Job, and say, I will not deny my integrity. I will not... Give in to a lie. Though my four so-called friends come and tell me that I'm wicked. I know I am not wicked. So I will stand my ground because I'm holy. I hold my integrity. And even though my wife said, you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. He said, woman, you speak foolishly. Should we take only good from God and not take bad as well? So Job hold his ground because he was pure. Amen. But if you are not pure and there's actually sin in your life and God starts to chasten you, what you need to do is do like what David did. You know, you all know the story of David, a mighty man of God, took out Goliath. Amen. The Bible said David was a man after God's heart. Amen. David, after he became king, and got all the glory of Israel. One day he went up on his roof and saw a beautiful woman showing. And he, you know, you know the sin that he commit. And not only did he commit that sin, he, he, he compounded with murder. And then when the prophet came to him and told him about the story of this rich man who had all this possession. And this one poor man that had one little sheep. And a visitor came to visit a rich man. And instead of the rich man take one of his sheep from his many multitudes of animals, a flock, he went and he took the one single little sheep that this poor man had and killed it to provide for his visiting guests. And when David heard that, oh, his wrath got hot like fire. He said, in Israel, never. This person should die. And Nathan said, you are that man. You took Nathan, you took, um, you, you took, you are your thing. Why? And you slept with her. And then when you couldn't get him to go and sleep with her so you could cover the sin, you, you kill him with the, the, the sword of the enemy. And when David heard, when David, when that, when, the, when Nathan said that to David, David, David didn't try to cover up anymore. He noticed he was exposed. And what David did, he repented. And if you read Psalm 51, that they said that is the Psalm that David did. David admit 
of his wrong. He confessed and he sought repentance. Amen? And that's why God could say about David, even though he missed the marks a few times, yet he had a heart after God because when sin was revealed to him, he would take the necessary steps to make it right. The Bible says, he who covers his sin is not wise. Amen? So today, the whole church world seems to be under this belief that it's better to cover our sin than to confess them and to repent. Rather than coming out and making it being different, we want to be close to the world so that we can, we can uh, are hiding behind the world. So we won't experience any persecution. Amen? But God is saying the time is now for the church be the church. The ecclesia, the called out one. We are not the same. God has called us, taken us out of Egypt, taken us through our wilderness. And have taken us through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, through our Jordan, and into the promised land. And God wants us to occupy until he comes. He don't want us to compromise. Amen? And we as a church, we have to be honest. God is speaking. And I could be like a Moses. I could be like a, a, like a Noah. I could stand in the gap and I could ask for God to hold back his wrath, but it only for so long. God will make an example so that others will see and fear. I know in today's world, they don't believe in deterrence. They believe in fixing it after the fact. You see, in the old days when you commit a crime, your ex, your death was gruesome. Lots of times there were public hanging. What do you think happened to Jesus Christ? They were sending a message to the rest of the people. If you break the laws of Rome, we will make a public uh, example of you in the most cruel and wicked way. Many millions of the Jews were crucified. You know that, right? Many of the apostles were crucified. And those people who would join themselves to Christ had to be sure that they were willing to pay the price because that could happen to them. So it became almost a deterrent to stop people from coming to Christ. You had to be willing to die for Jesus Christ. But looking at it at the other side, for those people who are just rebels for the sake of being rebels, this was also a deterrent because if you did wrong, when you get caught, you will be, you will make, we will make a public example of you. You will suffer for your sin. But today, you go and you kill 20 people and they put you in jail. They feed you. You could protest. You could demand a television. You could do whatever you want and you go on living. And we are wondering why there's so much disasters in the world today. The Bible says there's only one way that a land could be redeemed from the shedding of blood. Blood for blood. He who sheds man's blood, by him shall man's blood be shed. The Bible says that's the only way to purify the land. So all these people who are committing all these murders and their lives are not being taken, they're allowing to live on. That's why you, there are many disasters happening. The, the, the earth, the nations are vomiting out these nations because they, they, it can't hold anymore. It's crying out to be cleansed. Why is there no justice? And that's why you have disaster after disaster after disaster. And even when they bring forth the death sentence, they try to be humane. They don't want you to feel no pain. So they give a lethal injection and you just go to sleep and you die peacefully. If you're going to commit a sin, a crime, you're going to take out a few people. Is a lethal injection going to be determined to you? But if they would put you in the public square and bring down either the gallows or the hangman noose 
and put you on the trap door and pull that trap door and you suspended in midair and all of a sudden you, until you die. The murderers, the, the people who intended to go on and become murderers will see that and will think about it. Hmm, is that a price I'm willing to pay? Or if there's a guillotine or gallow and it just, it's raised up and you put your head down and they just, bam, and you see the head bounce, boom, boom, on the ground. You will think, do I want to commit this crime? But because we are so compassionate to the perpetrators, that even though they showed no mercy to their victims, we got to be merciful to them. We're not heeding what the world is saying. I don't know, there are many Christians who don't believe in capital punishment. Many Christians don't believe in it. Because they think it is not humane. Let me ask you a question. When God brings in floods and natural disaster, is that humane? If you don't do what God called us to do, then God will have to implement it himself. And God help us when he does that. So, what I'm trying to get across to us today is that God knows every one of our hearts today. He knows whether we are obedient or not. And he is warning. He is warning. He's about to make some of us public, not secret examples. Public examples. You see what Paul wrote to Timothy? He said, those who sin, go in a corner and tell them, my oh, sister, don't do that. No, what did he say? I read it this morning in 1 Timothy 5. He said, rebuke openly, publicly, that others would see and fear. In today's church, we don't do that. As they say, we don't hang out people dirty laundry. Amen. We hide. We hide this sin so that we will not embarrass them. But you know what? The church internally, the church may be hide, trying to hide these things. But I'm going to tell you something. The world is seeing these sins. You go and witness to a sinner man and he could tell you people in the church what they're doing. And the people of authority who should be Deterring these behaviors, they are just letting them slip by. There was a man in the Old Testament, a, a priest, his name was Eli. This man had some sons. And the sons were very evil, but because it was of the lineage of A when they were priests. Amen? So, what they would do? They would... When people bring the, 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 the offering, the sacrifice, they will put the, the hook into it and take whatever come and say it's, it's theirs, whatever left, that's for God's sacrifice. They would also sleep with the ladies who come to the offering, at the, the, the sacrifices. And Eli, Eli saw this and did nothing. And God warned him. And Eli still didn't know. He just said, sons, what you're doing is not good. And he took no further steps. And God judged Eli and removed him. That have not changed. In Revelation, we see the church, God said, if you do not repent, I will remove your candlestick. I'll remove you. Amen? So God is telling us, <clears throat> forget about the shame. Do the right thing. Put your house in order. These are the last warnings. Husband, honor your wives. If your home is in a mess, give God glory. If you can't fix your home, stay out. Don't come and try to fix the church of God. Amen? You gotta be first before faithful at home. Now, if you're doing everything that you want to do and it's not happening, then place them in the hand of God, but make sure that you are doing the will of God. Amen? And I'm gonna say something because we got a problem in this day and age. We are living in two, there's two supremacy in this world today, right now. There's the gay supremacy, where you can't speak anything against homosexuality. And then there's the feminist movement, where 
women run things. You can't say anything about women. Women are equal with men. They say gender is fluid. You could be whatever you want to be. If you feel like a man today, today you're a man. If you feel like a woman today, today you're a woman. They're equal. Gender is just skin deep. There is nothing more to it. So I'm yet waiting for the man to get pregnant and bring for the baby. I ain't see it yet. But we are biting to these things. And it have come into the church full force. The woman in the church is now, they have all the rights. They could do whatever they want. They don't have to honor their husbands. Especially if they're making more money than their husbands. They start referring to them as boys. The Bible said, and this is very hard for women. Sorry, men, it's very difficult, but it's what we have to do. The Bible said, even if you have an unbelieving husband, you must still respect and submit to him as unto the Lord. And then God will deal with that husband. He said, the Bible said, without fear. And if you are not submitting to your husband, I don't care how, how, how wrong he is or whatever. You are not giving God the opportunity to glorify himself. Because I don't care how wicked that husband is or disobedient. If you do what God tells you to do, he will fix the problem. And your husband, don't demand your wife to be submitted to you and then treat them like dirt. The Bible says, if you don't treat them with respect, when you pray, God ain't going to answer you. Amen? So, your husband has have to be willing not only to receive the honor of your wife, but you also have to be willing to take a bullet for them. You got to put your wife and your children before you and will be willing to lay down your life for them. Amen? Now, each of these requirements are not conditional on the other. So if the husband does not meet that requirement, the wife can say, well, I'm free from honoring him. No. And vice versa. Whether the other is doing it or not, it doesn't matter. You have to do your role. So even if the wife is not respecting you or honoring you, you must yet honor her and show her the love of God and be the man of the home. Even if your husband does not love you and respect you, you have to honor him and submit to him as unto the law. The only stipulation here is that you don't break the laws of God. Amen? In the churches, I know, and a lot of churches, they justify this, and there are lots of belief. But God have order in his churches. The Bible said, God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. The man is the head of woman. And in his church, there are rules and regulations that has to be followed. Amen? Whether we like them or not. We can say there were first century rules. They're not applicable to the 21st century. But everything that is written in here, unless it has an expiry date on it, it is relevant to us today. Amen? So we can't pick and choose what we like. When God says one thing, he doesn't mean another thing. I know there's some people who like to say, oh, when Paul was writing, he went to the Corinthian church because at that time, there were different behavior, the women were unruly and so forth. But Paul said, the reason why I write this not to you is because, and he gave the reason. It had nothing to do with the circumstance at that time. He said, because Adam was first and Eve is who sinned. And that's why this law is there, because God placed this law at the beginning, he said, you desire shall be unto your husband and shall rule over you because you sin first. And until you come again, until Christ comes again, that will stay the same. Likewise, he said at that time, the soul that sins shall die. Are people living forever down here right now? Aren't everybody still dying? But aren't we saved? Aren't we redeemed? You see, because that promise is not doesn't have an expiry with time in it. it. It will only come to an end when Jesus said the last enemy that's going to be defeated that is death. There's certain laws that were before the Levitical laws and they're going to reign through until Christ comes because they are before these laws. These are not circumstantial laws based just for Israel. They are laws for all humanity. 
So I'm saying all this to say this. The church today has to so-called pull up their pants. And we have to conform back to the image of Jesus Christ. We got to do things God's way. Because nothing is happening in our churches today. Maybe in other churches, I don't know. But nothing is happening because God will not bow down to us and do things. Show his glory when we do things our way. It got to be God's way. And I was watching news the other day. You know, a lot of these antibodies, antibiotics are no longer working. They said they have a lot of super bugs now. A lot of these things that were history that were totally eradicated years ago are now coming back and the drugs have no effect on them. This is a warning to the church. Medical science will not be able to help you. You're going to have to come back to God. There is coming many plagues upon this world. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times are going to come. There are going to be plagues and all kinds of things. They say, when you see these things start to happen, look up. Listen to the news. There are super bugs now out there that the antibiotics do nothing to them. They laugh at them. So where your hope is going to be? Isn't it better to be under the umbrella and the protection of God? We need to get back to the place where the power of God is alive again. So when people get sick, they're no longer going to the hospital because they're a waste of time. They come to the churches. They seek out the saints. So we as a church got to make sure we remove everything that is hindering the glory of God from coming upon our lives so that we can be in that position so that when these things start to take place, we are the light of the world. We are the source of health as God intended it to be. And we're not the laughing stock of the night shows. But we got to deal with the sin in the camp. We got to deal with the traditions in the camp. We got to put aside the things that are fleshly. And we must conform back to his image and to his likeness. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen. God is going to sweep everybody. The so-called good with the evil. Because those who call themselves righteous are as dark as those who are walking in darkness. So, my plea with you today, I know today is testimony Sunday, but I'm not in control. But God is speaking to us. God is warning us. And it's not on my request. My request was, Lord, be forever patient and do nothing. But God will have a holy seed. He will have a holy people. He will have a people who tremble at him. And when I say tremble, I mean literally tremble. We should not fear nothing or no man on this earth like we fear God. Don't just look at God as a buddy. When you're in obedience to God, it is beautiful. He's a father, a loving father who will take care of all you need, who will protect you and no weapon formed against you will prosper. But if you come against God by disobeying his rules, you better be very, very, very afraid because God is able to snuff you out just like that. We need to realize that God said, I am that I am. I will have mercy on who I will have mercy. A lot of us think that God has to have mercy upon us. He have no choice because he loves us all. And we could do whatever we want to and he has to have mercy on us. But God said, I raised up Pharaoh for this very reason. Have this heart. And if you poop, if you continue to stiffen your neck, God said he will give you over to a reprobate mind. You want to know why the church is full of so much homosexual and lesbian? Because they continue in their sin over and over and over and God gave them up to reprobate minds because they knew the truth and suppressed it in unrighteousness. And if you don't want to be given over, you should better fear and do the right thing. That's for all of us, including myself. None of us is exempted. We all must live the life to the end. Amen. Heavenly Father, I know service didn't go our planned way, Lord, but you, Lord, you know what you're doing, Lord. I feel your feeling. I feel your sadness. Lord, this has been my experience in my Christian walk. 
When you are happy, you transfer your joy to me. When I'm in an environment where you're pleased with it, I can feel your presence and your glory. And I know that you're happy because I feel the feeling that you feel. Likewise, God, when you're not pleased with the people and I'm in their presence, I feel your sadness. I feel your weeping, your crying, your urging, your admonition to them to make it right. I am not mock. Whatever one sows, he will reap the fruits thereof. You call us out to be holy, sanctified, set apart, a light to show forth your glory, your praise. The world should see a difference in us. We should be a different set of people from the world. Not puffed up, but gentle, loving, compassionate. Holy, undefiled, beyond reproach. Sin should not have dominion over us. Just like you said to Cain. Sin is crouching at your door. But I have given you power over it. But Cain didn't choose to take the rulership over the sin. He submitted to it. And likewise, God has given us this power. To overcome sin. But we must take that step to resist. And not to give in to it. Father, I ask, oh God, that you will have mercy upon us. Give us a little bit more time, Lord. Do not pour your wrath upon us. Lord, speak to us through your servants. Speak to us through dreams. Continue to speak to us through your chastening. To experiences. Lord, let us see. Let there be a witness. Come in one, twos, oh God. When you speak to our hearts, bring another situation that will confirm it. Lord, help us for many of us, our conscience have been shared. We're not seeing. Lord, many of us, we need to be our brother keepers because we cannot see our own sin, Lord. And we need our brothers and our sisters to be, to be loving to us and to show us our faults. Because some of us have come so accustomed to them that they no longer consider us to be false, but to be norms. And Father, because of this, our conscience are sheared and we cannot get convicted upon these flaws in us. Because there is no, no way the Holy Spirit could get through. But Father, we're asking you to, to, to remove that shear, that hard outer core, core that have been burned and prevent the heat from getting through. God, that your Holy Spirit could, could witness once again to us. That you could touch our heart. Give us a repentant heart. Lord, humble us, Lord. For God, we need your power in this day and age. Ordinary just will not do. We got to go beyond the ordinary. This The church is not a club. It is the extension of God on this earth. We must show forth your glory. We must be different. We must exemplify the life of Jesus Christ to this world. So Father, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, speak to us. First, starting with me. Expose, Lord, show me my flaws, oh God. My sins, oh God. Show me where I'm falling short, oh God. And if I'm not hearing, oh God, send somebody to speak to me in love and to show me where I'm falling short so that I can repent. Lord, I want to be holy before you. I want all your people here to be holy before you. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you will have your way in our lives. Make us into vessels of righteousness. For the call is there already. You said a harvest, I right not to harvest, but there's not much laborers. You refuse to send those who are not equipped into your harvest field. So Father, I pray, help us to equip ourselves to the grace and to the power of you, oh God, that we may become vessels of righteousness, vessels that you can use to your honor, to your glory. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name, and I thank you. Amen. If there's anybody out there who have not given your life to Jesus Christ, 
Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised. Life is as guaranteed. Death is as guaranteed as life. Every soul will eventually die. Every being will eventually die. And when you die, we all have to give an account to God. Amen? There is no second chance. I don't mean to scare, but I got to tell you the truth. Tomorrow is not promised. My, um, my, my brother that is older than me, his wife's sister, I think was the youngest of them. A few days ago, she just died. A young girl. Not, well, relatively speaking. A few months back, the, the, the brother died, the oldest brother died. Now the youngest sister died. Daughter died. And you look on the news. Death, nowadays these days, don't respect age. Once again, with the old people who were dying. But now, everybody, every age group, they're dying left, right, and center. I don't know if I'm going to see you next week. And honestly, I don't care. Once I'm living right, I don't care. I know it sounds selfish, but the way this world is going, I would like to stay here and do the work that God has called me to do. But if God give me an early retirement plan, I'm sorry, I'm taking it. Because the wickedness of this world is just driving me crazy. But if God wants me to stay here and do a work, I will stay. But I can't guarantee that I will be here tomorrow. And I can't guarantee that you would be here tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Today we should make it right with the Lord. But there's an appointment. It's hard-coded. Even though sometimes it is cut short and sometimes it's extended. But for most of the time, it is right on the button. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after that comes the judgment. No second chance. There's no chance after that. So I'm, I'm pleading with you. If you're not serving Jesus Christ, give your life to him today. He will take you as you are. And by his power, he will transform you. He will make you into a vessel of righteousness supernaturally. He will change your desires. You won't have to say, I, I will have to try not to do the sin and try to do the good. No. You just have to yield to him and his Holy Ghost will change you from the inside out. He will make you into a new creature. You won't have to depend upon your own strength anymore. You just trust in the Lord by faith. And he, as you lay before him, he will change you. So don't look at Christianity as being a difficult thing. We have made it difficult because we have tried to do it in ourselves. But God is the one who will and to do his good pleasure in all of us. So if you, today is a good day to give your life to Jesus Christ. Escape the wrath of God that is coming. Amen. So is anyone who would like to give the life to Jesus Christ? Today is the day of salvation. Okay. For the saints. For the saints. Those who call or those who name the name of Jesus Christ. I'm pleading with you. Let us become our brother's keepers. Let us look out for each other. We need each other. Okay. If we see sin in each other. Do not gossip, but go and approach each other in love and encourage them to turn away. Pray for their repentance. Do not judge nobody. Nobody in this church should be putting out another person who have fallen short. Amen? We need to be restoring one another in the spirit of meekness. We need to be lovingly pursuing the restoration. There is no glory in a brother or sister dying and losing their soul. It's a loss to the kingdom of God. There is no joy in that. The Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. We likewise cannot take any pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. So we got to pray for our loved ones. We got to pray for those of the household of faith and be there for them. Examine ourselves. This is becoming over and over and over. God is bursting at his seams to pour out his, his glory upon us. But he cannot unless we do the first work. So I'm pleading with you. Please. 
examine yourself and make it right today. Because I'm kind of getting a hint in the background that he's, he might have to encourage us a little bit by making one of us a public example. And I hope it is not me. I hope I am humble enough to see my wrong and to repent. But if God is going to make a public example, I may be the best place to start. And I, I hope that I, I, I am humble enough to make it right. If there's any sins in my life, to make it right. I'm not exempted. I am right now, I am actually very fearful when it comes to God. God does not play. I don't want to miss the mark. I don't want none of you to miss the mark. I'm not going to ask anybody to stand. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward of the sins. But I'm going to ask you to go home and seriously forget about the past. We are in our eighth year. According to Numbers, eight is a new beginning. Amen? God wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants us to become a church that is governed and empowered by Him. I'm pleading with all the saints who fellowship here. Go home, seek the Lord, ask Him to show you your faults, and then ask Him to give you the grace Repent and ask me to give you the grace to overcome them. Stop trying to be a good person in yourself. You're going to fail. You don't have it within you, in your own self. It's only by the grace of God. God will give you the power to overcome. But we must confess. Amen? Please, I love you all. I'm not trying to put nobody down. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I want us all to make it in. I want to see all of your faces in glory because the other option is not nice. The rich man was so tormented. He said, I don't even want a glass of water. Not even a glass of water. Just a job. Could you imagine you could be so hungry that you said, if you could just give me a crumb, a bread crumb, I would be happy. You know how how desperate that is? Please, I'm pleading with us, please. Make it right, all of us. Families, I'm going to say, I'm not, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come up. A lot of our homes are not in order. A lot of the wives are not submitting to their husband, and other husbands are not honoring their wives. We got to make it right. Because it starts at home. If we can't make the home right, this church will never move on. God will replace us. So we got to start at home. A strong home make strong churches. Weak homes make weak churches. The, the scripture I just read to you, the Bible says, if one does not take care of his family, he is worse than an unbeliever and have denied faith. The Bible says, any want to be a rule, a leader in the church, he must first have his home in order. But how could he put the church rule a church if he can rule his own home? So let all of us, as much as it depends upon us, because it's not always possible, but as much as it depends upon us, let us have a, our home that is in order. But if the other half don't want to submit, then you submit to God and God will do the rest. Guarantee. Amen? Amen. Are we going to go forward for the Lord? Are we going to Forget about the personal shame. And are we going to make it right? Whatever it takes, we're going to make it right for the Lord because we don't have a choice. It's do or die. There's no neutral ground. Amen? Stand with me, please. I know there are a few of us here who are not doing, feeling well. I know Nathan not feeling well. And I would like to take this chance to, to pray and ask God to overlook our shortcomings and touch our bodies. Is there anyone else in here who are not feeling well and need the touch of God? God is able. God can do above and beyond what we can imagine. Anybody who needs a touch from the Lord, God is here not only to correct us, but He's also here to bless us and to heal us. By His stripe, we were healed. We are healed. It is a, a gift. It is given already. We have to lay holds of it. The promises of God are yea and amen. 
And it's not works of Christ that we have done, but because of his finished work. This oil has no magical power. But we anoint, the Bible said, those who are sick, call on the elders and let them anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith over them. And they will be healed and the sin will be forgiven. Father, to these three who are standing before you, God. Father, you know what the situation is, oh God. Father, I know you can do abundantly above all we could think or ask, Lord. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he bear the stripes upon his back for our healing, Lord. And right now we are crying out unto you. We're asking for your mercy. We pray that you will reach down right now and touch all of these bodies, oh God. And those who are represented here who are sick likewise, but not here, not able to come to the church, oh God. Father, I pray that you will send your word even right now. And you will heal, oh God, by your power, oh God. Not by my touch, but by your touch, Lord. Rise them up right now by your power. And restore their health. We curse all manner of sickness. We, we replace weakness with strength. In the name of Jesus Christ. We replace worrying with peace. Father, I thank you that you are the omnipotent God. The all powerful God. All things are possible with you. And we thank you for your healing touch this day. Lord, I'm not asking. I'm going to step further. I'm not asking just for healing. But I'm asking for a, a miracle. A miraculous manifestation of the healing right now. Lord, I ask this. But not my will, but thy will be done. And Lord, I give you thanks. Right now, I thank you for your grace and for your power being upon these three. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.